Welcome back. This is the Resilience of Tech Leadership Session at LTW Connects. A very warm welcome if you're just joining us as well. My name's Ollie Barrett and I'm our virtual MC for the afternoon's proceedings. We've just heard from the Secretary of State for Culture, Oliver Dowden, talking about tech at the heart of the UK's revival and renewing some of the government's commitments to that. Coming up in our session, we have got a conversation with the chief exec of one of the world's best known publishers, Condé Nast. We've got a panel conversation about how organizations have pivoted through this last few months. What have they had to do differently and what have they learned? Thank you very much if you've been tweeting, hashtag LTW Connects. We've got so many of you joining us, but let's try and spread the word a bit further as well. We're going all the way through this afternoon and uh, you'll be able to ask questions to our guests. Firstly, of course, to Roger Lynch imminently and then to all of our panel through the questions and answers box on your dashboard. So please do fire up the questions and uh, get them pinging through. Many of you will already be familiar with London and Partners, one of the co-founders of London Tech Week doing so many good things. It's attracting businesses, tourists, events to London. In, in essence, it's London's promotional agency, very much with the mayor supporting it at its heart. I'm delighted to say that its chief exec is going to join me any second now. Before this role, Laura Citroen played a very central role at WPP, the biggest communications firm on the planet and knows a thing or two about making impactful introductions around the world. Today, she's the Chief Exec of London and Partners, so I'm delighted to welcome Laura Citron. Laura. Thank you so much, Ollie, and thank you very much also for providing the fireside, which is obviously vital to a fireside chat. There's a chat behind you. Um, <laughs> welcome, everyone, and um, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm delighted to be joined today by Roger Lynch, CEO of Condé Nast. Roger has one hell of a leadership challenge on his hands. Not only is he Condé Nast's first ever global CEO, leading the UK and national brands, he was also just months into his tenure when coronavirus hit. And just this week, the chief of US food magazine, Bon Appetit, one of the biggest brands in the Condé Nast Stable resigned over racist behaviour. As an aeroplane physicist. So he now runs Vogue, which just goes to show that science and style go hand in hand. So, Roger, welcome to London Tech Week. Thank you very much, Laura. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's let's start with a conversation about something that's very current and very important, racism and the Black Lives Matter movement. As a business with a global audience of a billion people in over 30 countries, you clearly have a very powerful platform. And you've also been very candid about what needs to change within Condé Nast in your view. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure, sure. You know, as you mentioned, Laura, first uh, and foremost, we, we are a leader in almost every category where we publish content. And as I tell our teams all the time, you know, with that becomes a responsibility to lead. And whether it's issues around social justice or um, tackling the pandemic, uh, I'm always pushing our teams to make sure we're taking leadership positions in it. So first and foremost, where we have can have an impact is through our journalism. And, uh, we, and we cover it extensively through all of our brands, but uh, uh, really most poignantly, I think, through The New Yorker and Wired. Um, and it, it, and we've, you know, one of the things we've done is made all of that content available for free, just like we did on the coronavirus, to make sure it can reach the largest possible audience. But it's it's clearly not enough to just do good journalism around it. We also have to make sure our own house is in order. And as you mentioned, uh, earlier this week, we had uh, an issue that came up that I, you know, clearly has been simmering for a while uh, within one of our brands, Bon Appetit, that, uh, that did res result in the editor-in-chief resigning. And it also 
resulted in, I think, a much needed conversation within the company that had started before, but I think really has taken on, <clears throat> you know, much more uh, urgency for us. And it's it's really not about diversity and inclusion anymore. I think, you know, we've done a bunch of things like that. We, when I came in, we created a global employee council, because as you mentioned, um, you know, the history of Condé Nast was really some independent companies, and I'm the first CEO to actually manage the company globally. We created a, a, a global task force on this. It's been doing some really good work, but the discussion really has been reframed um, away from diversity and inclusivity to racism. And that I actually think is a positive uh, because racism will cause action. Reframing these issues as racist issues will cause action more so than framing them as diversity and inclusivity issues. And so as painful as it may be to go through some of the things we have to go through, I actually think it's gonna bring about better, quicker and more lasting change. Thanks, Roger. Really interesting to, to hear your framing on that because obviously a lot, of, a lot of businesses around the world are taking a moment of introspection, probably a, a long overdue one and, and our organization is, is no different and really thinking about what we can do better. But, but I think it's interesting, you know, your point on the way that we, that we think about it and whether we, we look at it through a lens of racism or diversity and inclusion is, is a really important one. Let's turn now to coronavirus and what that's meant for Condé Nast. You have a big digital audience, but your heritage is a business that prints things out and sends them to lots of different places around the world. So what has coronavirus meant for you and, and how have you responded? Yes, you know, as you mentioned earlier, we, we publish in over 30 countries around the world. One of the largest markets for us is China. Uh, we have a large workforce there and a very, very large audience there for print and digital. And obviously that's where the virus started. And so we had to um, react quickly as we started to see it impact uh, the, the, uh, the potential health of our employees at the end of January. And we started working on continuity plans, testing remote access. China was the first market where all of our employees started working remotely. And we had set up a task force to learn from that process, learn what they, and importantly, any mistakes that were made so that we could apply them in the next market, which was Italy, where they started working from home and then went to France, Spain, um, UK, US, and eventually all of our markets. And there was a point in time where virtually 100% of our employees, uh, we have about 6,000 employees were working remotely. And it was, it was a, you know, Obviously, the, the biggest concern was the health of the employees. And once we felt like we had that, uh, at least from a company pa uh, perspective, managed as best we could, then we wanted to make sure we could still produce the content, especially the content that is in public interest. And I've been so impressed how the company responded to that because um, we, you know, all of our publications, whether it's print, digital, video, uh, continued to be published. We didn't have to cut back on anything. And, but it required a lot of innovative thinking and a lot more cooperation because as I mentioned a little bit earlier, you know, the history of Condé Nast, because it was a print company, global print company, really operated like a lot of autonomous businesses in each country, which I think was okay when it was all print. But today, the majority of our revenue is not print. It's digital and video and other things. And one of the missions I was on even before this was to really integrate it as a global company. The pandemic required us to do that because all of a sudden different markets needed to rely on each other to do things that they never would have done before. An example might have been, I think one of our publications in Spain, this was while still people, you know, um, people were still working um, and doing photo shoots, needed to do a photo shoot in Los Angeles. And instead of what they would have normally done, which is get a photographer, a stylist, and whole team and send them out there for the, they called up the team that we had in Los Angeles and asked them to do it for them. And so there are things like that that are quite simple, but just had never been done before within Condé Nast and sort of got forced by this. And that has been, you know, one of the many things that we will apply in our business practices as we do start to come back to work and things start to return to whatever the new normal will be for us. Yeah, fascinating to hear about how 
how this has forced you to come together as a global business. And tell us a bit about how some of your brands have been responding, because some of them have been really innovative in the way that they are changing the way they engage audiences for, for the lockdown. Yes, it's, um, you know, the one thing that, you know, I think most publishers have, have seen, but uh, you know, we've seen really significantly is growth and engagement through all of our digital properties. And that engagement has come really across the board, but specifically, you know, content around the pandemic and now content around social justice. Uh, it's also driving you know, huge increases in subscription to our to our uh, magazines and to digital properties. But there's many things that we've had to change in how we do our business. And one of the most obvious things is events. You know, I think Condé Nast operates about 750 events globally each year. And these are everything from <clears throat> maybe a small event at a retail store in Italy to the Met Gala, which is one of our events, or the Vanity Fair Oscar party. And as we had to start shifting these events, the first thing we did is we had to postpone them or cancel them. But then we started looking at how we could create some of these events as virtual events or create new events. Um, example would be Teen Vogue uh, did a virtual prom for all the high school seniors who are getting ready to graduate without a prom. And uh, Lindsay Peoples Wagner, our, our uh, editor in chief of Teen Vogue was really innovative in how to, she created that and we got some sponsors to help support it. And it was a huge success. And, she went on from that and created a uh, virtual commencement uh, for uh, high schoolers who are graduating. And so move to, to virtual events has been one of the things that uh, obviously we've had to do, uh, and, but also just figuring out how to operate our business in a remote way and still do all of the physical things like physical magazines that get delivered all around the world uh, has required you know, huge and fast shifts in how our workforce operates. Fascinating. And, and you touched there briefly on, on, on public interest journalism and how you've made your Corona content free. You know, New Yorker in particular has, has really been at, at the forefront on, on that and on social justice issues, but also digital transition and the challenges, which I think are very well known to the business models of commercial publishers. So how do you see those two things colliding or, or how do you balance the need to run a business with the public interest and in quality independent content? You know, I think, I think there's, there's a, a, a temptation that has to be resisted, which is just look at what, which activities that you do that generate commercial benefit and do more of those and do less of the things that like that, that is, that is a huge mistake for a company like ours to, uh, and, we're, and we're not doing that. The, the, you know, the, the, the source of the strength of our business is our brands and our people. And that includes, we have 1800 journalists around the world. And a lot of that journalism is not the type of journalism you could look at and say, ah, oh, that creates this business outcome, but it is core to the brands that we, that we operate. And so the, the, the key thing that is important for us is to continue to be innovative on the revenue side. And so, as I mentioned, you know, we are a company that whose heritage is print and yet print advertising now is a minority of our revenue. And the majority of our revenue is digital and video and, 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 and video in particular is a very fast growing part of our, our business. But all of that requires us to think about how do we create new revenue streams that fundamentally can support our brands. And when I talk about our brands, fundamentally that is our journalism that we do. And so rather than looking at it as this type of journalism produces this type of business outcome, I really look at it as how do these, how do we support these brands by being innovative on the revenue side so that they can do what they really do best? It's a really, it's a really impressive commitment. And as a leader, you must be on a daily basis having to make those judgments and um, take those calls about getting that, getting that balance right. You've come obviously from a very much from a broadcast heritage from Pandora and streaming. Um, and, and your other businesses before. Tell us a bit about how you found the experience of becoming CEO of Condé Nast. Um, you're under a year into the role. Um, and maybe tell us a bit about what you've learned taking on this role, leading this, this, this huge global family of brands. Yeah. It's, you know, this is a, um, in, in many ways, 
a very new experience for me. This is the fifth company that I run. A um, number of the companies that I ran before were companies I started. I didn't start Pandora, the most recent one, but uh, others I had started. But the one thing that was common in all of those companies, they were direct to consumer companies that use technology to innovate how content was distributed. But in each of the prior cases, the content was content someone else created. In the case of Pandora, it was Pandora's, by the way, for those of you outside of the US, Pandora is the largest music streaming service in the US. It was, we were licensing content from all the music labels. Prior to that, I created a company called Sling TV that was innovating, you know, it was the first live streaming sort of virtual cable system in the US. And we were licensing the, con the content from all the big channel providers. And so what I wanted to do next after we sold Pandora a little over a year ago was I still like the idea of innovating around how content is distributed and using technology. But really, I, I came to the conclusion that going forward, the big tech platforms are going to be pretty dominant in that space for content that is widely available, a non-exclusive content. If you can license that content, they're going to license it, and they're going to use their ecosystem and, and, and sheer scale um, to dominate in that space. So I wanted to do something where I could still innovate, but yet we had our own content, uh, exclusive content that that uh, really we could control. And you know, when when they approached me about Condé Nast, I thought it was just perfect because you know it's fantastic, stable of brands. It, it's a business that needs big transformation, and I really, really like challenges like that. And yet, it still has the opportunity to innovate, innovate around technology. And so, we, you know, we've been on that mission since I started here and uh, set up a strategy where we're focusing on um, integrating the business, but also supporting these new initiatives like the video, which is the fastest growing part of our business, and direct to consumer which is a really important part of it. Again, you know, the history of publishing companies is they thought mostly about advertisers. And advertising still is the majority of our revenue, whether it's print, digital, or video advertising. And yet the consumer side of our business is a really important area that's growing where, we, where consumers are paying us to interact with our brands, which could be a subscription to a physical magazine, a digital uh, a property, or a membership program. And so we're, we're really part of the strategy is get a better balance of advertising revenue, consumer revenue, and then continue to fund uh, high growth initiatives like our video. Really interesting. And thank, thank you for sharing those thoughts on, on how you're evolving the business model. And you're, you're clearly bound for the job. And I can, can, can really see how those previous experiences you've had on direct to consumer are making such an impact at, at Condé Nast. I think we've got lots of questions, uh, which doesn't surprise me. I'm sure we have lots of people in the audience who've got great questions they'd like to put to you. So I'm going to hand back to Ollie, who, if it's all right with you, Roger, is just going to share some questions from the audience. Ollie, over to you. Thank you, Laura. I feel like I'm doing the weather over here. This is great. Uh, thank you, Roger, uh, for the story so far. There have been a lot of questions. Uh, here's a very personal one. It's about your leadership style and how it's changed during lockdown, if at all. What have you noticed? Well, you know, for me, one of the things that's, as a leader, that I try to really focus on is transparency, honesty, communication, you know, the, th the thing I've learned uh, and, and, you know, most of the, the best lessons I've learned are from the mistakes I've made throughout my career. And, and one of the things I've certainly learned is you cannot communicate enough. But, you know, as a leader, when you're really tired of how many times you've said something, you probably still haven't said it enough because um, especially in times of crisis, employees really want to hear from the leaders, not just me, but other leaders across the company. And so, it's, it's required, obviously, a shift in how we do that. And I'm doing more things like this. Like, you know, this week I did a global uh, company meeting uh, stream live from the same location. Uh, and uh, it, it, that's something I would normally have done in person in one of our markets around the world. I usually do it uh, uh, from a different market each time. But, um, uh, and also just increasing the amount of email I send out, videos that I send out really focus on uh, keeping people informed, especially as there's lots of things that are changing in our business right now. You know, as I mentioned, we're still very advertising heavy in our revenue stream and advertising has been hit very uh, significantly 
because of the pandemic. And, and that just means one thing, communicate more. Yeah. Laura, if you'll forgive me, I'm going to get through another couple of questions because they keep coming through. If you submit a question, it'll come through anonymously. So if you want it to be in your name, do put your name into that question box. Roger, this is a question about diversity, particularly in a senior leadership team. How do you diversify senior leadership teams and avoid only having a diverse entry level workforce? Big challenge. Yeah, yeah. That that That's something that... Um, in my experience, people think, you know, or I've heard that people say, well, you know, if you want to create diversity, you have to, you have to um, compromise on something else. And I think that is true in one, in one instance. The thing you have to be prepared to compromise on is time, time to fill a position. But you don't need to compromise on anything else. And in fact, I, I think when people say that, they, they, it, it, it belies the issue, the understanding of what diversity brings, the value of diversity. And I know for me that I make the best decisions when I have diverse viewpoints to help inform me and to challenge me. So, you know, when, when I'm looking to fill a senior role and we always look to make sure we have a diverse set of candidates for that role, if I'm working with a search firm and they come forth without it, I just send them back to the drawing board. Right. And it usually... It usually means that we just have to wait longer, work harder, put more pressure on them until we get, but we always get the right result. It just takes longer. That's the one thing my advice is be prepared to compromise on time and nothing else. Right. A very specific question was the first one to come through, Roger, and it goes to what Laura asked you about right at the top of the interview. What practical actions are Condé Nast taking to address racism across the organization? Yeah. The, you know, when I, when I first joined the company, <clears throat> I started traveling around to all of our markets and talking to employees. I wanted to learn the company. I wanted to connect with the employees. And importantly, I wanted to learn what the top issues were on their minds. And as I traveled around the world, there were two issues that came up in every employee meeting that I went to. And one was on diversity and inclusivity, and the other was on sustainability. So even before we started merging the company and I had to make you know, a lot of executive changes. Uh, we, we set up two employee, global employee councils on those subjects, sustainability and diversity and inclusivity. And then we started making commitments that were driven from these employee groups that were pushing us and challenging us, um, which is exactly how I like it to, to do this. And there are a whole bunch of initiatives that we've done around diversity and inclusivity, but it's the one thing that I think, especially that what's happened over the last few weeks is, is really challenging us is it's not enough to just create new forums for discussion. It is not enough to set, you know, like one of the things we'll be doing is we'll be publishing this summer uh, our diversity statistics. And then we'll also set goals for it. I did this at Pandora also. We'll set goals for it publicly and I'll report back on those goals. That's all great. But as I mentioned earlier, the, the reframing of this discussion uh, away from diversity and about racism to me is one of the most important things that's happening right now. Yeah. Because it will help spur an action in ways that would not have happened before. Um, now, I urge all of you to think about it. When, you, when your employees start talking about racism, don't shy away from that. Embrace it and figure out how you actually root out racism in your organizations. Yeah. Roger, I'm going to let Laura ask any final question, but I do have a question which has come from uh, the team at London and Partners itself. It's your advice of building strong brands. What lessons have you learned that could be adapted for a global city like London to retain its global brand and position? You're coming from one of the world's great cities, but how do, how do we keep that step ahead? Ah, Well, London is very near and dear to my heart personally. It's actually the city... I lived in longest than any other city in my life. And so uh, I have special affection for it. And, uh, uh, and you know, it's been 12 years since I moved away from London and I've been disheartened to see some of the things that, that have happened because it is such a fantastic city. I really, really love the city. It's, you know, it's, and it's also our, you know, we have two headquarters. One is in New York and all of our international businesses are headquartered around London. And so it's something I think about a lot um, and being an organization that, that uh, is, is so far flung across all these markets. And we have, I think, people from 30 different countries that work for us in London. 
Um, and I'm hearing it from them, concerns about, should we still be working from London or are we going to be able to work from London and what does it mean? And that's really concerning to me. So, you know, I think first and foremost, communication and clarity so that people understand how, you know, especially people from, you know, who are expats who are living in London, how their lives, how they can continue to do that and, you know, exiting the European Union, what does it really mean for them? Because I, you know, what I hear from our teams, they still don't really understand what that means. And I think that's hurting the brand right now. And so as most things, when there's things in transition, you have to up your communication uh, with your constituencies. Roger, thank you for answering those questions so candidly. Laura, back to you for a final word. Roger, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today and especially as it is so early for you where you are um you've been so generous with your time and open in your answers and we will definitely come and have a brand masterclass with you for london so roger lynch ceo of conde nas thank you for joining us at london tech week connect thank you thanks everyone well, thank you again to Roger Lynch and thank you to Laura Citroen as well. Great to see you, Laura. Thank you so much. That's Laura Citroen sitting by the fireside with Roger Lynch. Laura, the chief executive of London and Partners, London's promotional agency. Well, thank you for submitting your questions. We've got lots of good conversation still to come here at LTW Connects, a panel addressing this big, big subject of pivoting in the face of adversity. What have Intel noticed from their global clients and networks? How about IBM? And what about some of the upstarts and scale-ups? We've got Caroline Plum, serial entrepreneur, reflecting on what she has learned. And to lead us through it, Founders Intelligence as well. So we're gonna take a 10 minute short networking break. Please do meet and connect with each other and reflect on what you've seen so far, hashtag LTW Connects. We'll be back in 10 minutes, so at 10 to, or rather 20 to four. Very much looking forward to seeing you after the break for pivoting in the face of adversity. <laughs>